the shooting range. In this episode, pages of history, the Yom Kippur War, and the hell it brought upon Sinai, tactics and strategy, the right way to use the landscapes around you on tanks of different nations, and metal beasts, the regular yak with an unusual engine. Our guest today is a Soviet fighter at BR 5.7, the last piston engine aircraft of this tech tree created in Yakovlev's construction bureau. Meet the Yak 3U. This plane received a radial engine, which is very unusual for the Yak family. Because of this decision, the designers changed the nose part of the fuselage and a lot of other elements. And you can easily mistake this Yak for an aircraft of the LA series. The Yak 3U is extremely maneuverable. So not only can you compete with the strongest opponents of your class, you can also resist the first jet enemies as well. So let's take a closer look. The machine's got a two-spar straight wing. The nose part of the fuselage stores the aforementioned force radial engine. Next to it, there is the offensive armament, a couple of 20mm B-20S cannons. The rear part of the pilot's cabin is protected by an 8mm steel plate and 64mm of bulletproof glass. Finally, inside the wings, we can find a couple of self-sealing fuel tanks. This Yak-3 modification doesn't have any additional payload options, but neither do its neighbors in this tech tree. This is a pure blood fighter. The offensive weapons show a decent fire rate, but the ammo is quite limited. You've only got 240 bullets, so you'll want to carefully pick the ideal moment before taking a shot, especially if you remember that a one-second burst here is one of the heaviest on this tier. What you cannot possibly complain about is maneuverability. The Yak-3U needs only 18 seconds to turn which is faster than most of its opponents in possible dogfights. And you can make them go into a dogfight with you by using your forced engine that, if you so wish, can speed you up to 700 kph in a horizontal flight. In all other cases, this is still the good old Yak-3 that, thanks to a new engine, lasted all the way until the end of the piston engine era. Its favorite strategy is to fly right inside the chaos of an air battle, tail one of the opponents and never let go, until the target is crushed by a series of short but deadly bursts of fire and lead. This is the role that was written for this aircraft, and this is where it shines the brightest. Though you want to generally evade the enemy jet fighters, as the Yak-3U won't be able to chase them over a distance, you might still catch them off guard using your better maneuverability. As for the preferable ammo belts, we recommend using the one for armored targets. Its one-second burst isn't that heavy, but it can penetrate 25 millimeters of armor, which can be lethal not just for air targets, but to some of the enemies on the ground as well. Everybody knew that the Middle East wouldn't stay calm this time. In one corner of the ring, there was Israel that had already defeated the Arab countries in several previous sparrings, including the Six-Day War of 1967. In the opposite corner, there was the whole Arab world that longed for a rematch for many years. It was obvious that the fire would start soon enough. It was unpredictable, though, that the flame would get this hot. It all started on the 6th of October, 1973, the Yom Kippur Day, the Atonement Day, the holiest day of the year in Judaism. 
when even the non-Orthodox citizens of Israel try not to do anything related to work. Television is off on this day. The airports are closed. And it was exactly the day when the Arab forces started the all-out attack from every direction they could, which was basically all of them. The Egyptian army quickly launched pontoon bridges over the Suez Canal and stepped on the Sinai Peninsula. The rare Israeli defense forces were crushed before they even realized the size of the attacking forces. The hastily gathered Israeli reservists jumped into their centurions and set out to help the soldiers guarding the borders, only to get their own share of astonishingly devastating fire. This wasn't the old Egyptian army fighting against them. They had machines that were made in the USSR. Countless avalanches of T-55 and T-62 tanks. The fast PT-76 light tanks that traversed the Suez Canal in mere minutes and immediately launched into action, running over the Israeli outposts. Even the new BMP-1s that weren't even widely seen in the Soviet army yet. They were also fighting this battle. But the scariest weapon of them all was the 9M14 Malyutka ATGM. The Egyptians were burning the Israeli tanks like it was some sort of a practice exercise for them. There were also major casualties among the defending air forces because the Egyptians had created a huge air defense dome above the offensive tanks. Any Israeli fighter or bomber that would somehow pass through the first enemy, untouched, would meet lots of Egyptian shilkas and their newest surface-to-air missiles. The Israeli command started to realize the grave danger of the situation. This wasn't a simple border conflict. This was a war of extermination. A single mistake would jeopardize the existence of the entire country. They'd even started adding special rounds with nuclear warheads as a payload option for the Israeli aircraft. If the pilots would lose their temper at some point in a battle, well, the landscape of that area would look a lot different today, that's for sure. But the Egyptians were the first ones to make a mistake this time. Following the orders from Cairo, tank brigade commanders kept going further into the country without waiting for sufficient reconnaissance, or for that matter, without waiting for air defense or communications personnel to catch up with them. Moreover, the Egyptians were attacking from multiple and always spreading directions. Imagine hitting someone not with your fist, but with an open hand with your fingers spread as wide as possible. Looks exotic, sure, but not efficient at all. So, on the 14th of October, the Israeli tankers from the second reserve wave used all the tanks they could get their hands on from the newest M60s and the previously captured T-55s and to the good old Shermans to blow a massive counter hit right at the bases of those spreading palms of Egyptian tanks. More than 1,500 tanks fought in that horrifying slaughter. It was the biggest tank battle since World War II. The survivors later remembered that the ground was shaking so heavily that they thought it was indeed Judgment Day. Sometimes, tanks from both sides almost collided, with only a couple of meters between them. They just couldn't see each other because of the omnipresent clouds of dust, smoke, and fires. A huge battlefield, 200 kilometers wide, had gone completely dark. Since the visibility was constantly less than 50 meters, the ATGM became useless as well as the powerful long-range Egyptian weapons, and the still-attacking Egyptian tanks got ambushed or stumbled upon massive minefields. The casualties they suffered were catastrophic, and by the end of the 14th of October, they just had to turn back. This wasn't the end of it, not by a long shot. But the Egyptians had lost their aggressive spirit. Israel had managed to still exist after these vitally important days, until help from the USA came in. The newest planes with modern means of air electronic warfare completely turned the tide in favor of the defensive forces. They still had a lot to do. Cross the Suez Canal, invade Egypt, attack the Golan Heights, and the politicians had to go through very stressful negotiations where one stray word 
could restart the Sinai massacre all over again. But thankfully, it didn't. In the end, they managed to implement some kind of peace. Sure, it wasn't very quiet, but this region has never seen a fight this big and brutal ever since. Knowing how to play on different landscapes and using them to your advantage is one of the key elements which help you succeed on ground tech. The turrets of most tanks are protected much better than their hulls. There's even a military term, hull down, used to describe exactly this position. Turret visible, hull hidden. Still, tanks of certain in-game nations require different approaches to the way you use the battlefield. Let's figure them out. One of the most crucial parameters of a tank that determines your playstyle in different environments is your lowest depression angle. We'll make an example of the Soviet tanks for now. They lack good depression angles, don't they? Be it the IS-2 or the T-80, you'll be lucky to get to minus 6 degrees. And sometimes, minus 3 is all you can have. That doesn't sound so good, especially if you remember that most of the American Shermans can easily depress their weapons to minus 10 degrees. So, what now? The Soviet machines can't use terrain folds at all? Eh, not quite. If you look at the T-34 and the ones that came before it, then sure, they do tend to be more effective on planes. But starting with the IS-3 and the T-54 1947, the Soviet designers came up with an idea of semi-spherical and slightly flattened turrets. The armor slope angles there are astronomically high, so the enemy has a hard time trying to pierce even the thinnest turrets of this type. The rounds tend to ricochet from them too, so these machines would be perfect on almost flat maps, with certain features deep enough to hide the vulnerable lower armor plates. Another thing about late Soviet tanks is that they have a very dense layout. Plus, the MBTs and medium tanks starting at the T-44 are lower than most of their Western counterparts. So, the ideal position for them is mid-range and a bit higher than the enemy. Otherwise, if they lose the high ground, they risk getting an unwanted present right through the roof. While playing on these machines, it's extremely crucial to learn how to swing. We've talked about it in the previous episode of the shooting range. A sharp start or stop will swing your suspension, allowing you to shoot at angles that are normally outside your reach. The Western tanks are very different from the Soviet ones. Whether it's a tiny Valentine or a huge Abrams, they've all got impressive elevation angles. Which can't be said about the armor, though, at least not always. For example, the turrets of the British Cromwells or the Italian Ariettes will rarely hold a punch. Also, the Western tanks are often really huge. It won't be easy to hide a chieftain or something like that on a flat map, so their preferable spots are the most difficult areas, for example, behind high hills, where they can hide their entire enormous hulls. And surely, the kings of such rough landscapes are American heavy tanks, like the T-32. Even an APFSDS round won't always pierce that one's turret. There's one other country that has its own approach to tank building. We're talking about Japan, of course. Tanks of that tech tree have great elevation angles as in the West, but they've also got a unique technology the hydropneumatic suspension. The STB-1 and tanks of the Type 74 series can incline their hulls to any of four directions, plus raise and lower their whole hulls as well. Thanks to this ability, the Japanese tanks feel quite comfortable on any surface. Still, they are also more demanding in terms of control. You need to know that for sure. 
what hydropneumatic configuration you need to use in every movement. The first message was sent by a player called Limo Nude. Now that the official War Thunder channel told some MBTs are far superior to the others, wouldn't it make sense to decron press top tier? There isn't a tank in War Thunder that performs exactly the same as another one on any rank, including the top MBTs. But that doesn't mean that there are extremely powerful and hopelessly weak among them. The difference between the MBT on the same tier isn't big at all. Some are a bit faster, some are a bit tougher, some have more spacious layout and are generally bigger, and others have a more dense one and tend to be smaller because of that. What really makes a tank a lot stronger than the others is you, knowingly using its features to complete your most efficient playstyle. A user called Manos Raun asks, What do you guys are up to make a climbing the ranks with the Soviet tanks line? Uh, wait a second. There already is one, isn't there? Yeah, there is. It's uploaded almost exactly one year ago, and it's still quite relevant. Just search Climbing the Ranks with Soviet Tanks on YouTube, and this one should be the first you'll see. So you can enjoy it right after you finish watching this episode. Then there's a question sent by Coco. Come you are the hydraulics in the vehicles? Obviously not all the machines had hydraulic suspensions, but the ones that did have it in real life, they have it in the game as well. Their behavior is simulated accordingly, and we've just mentioned a couple of machines like that a couple of minutes ago. Edwin Joseph writes, I can't believe you're all teaching players to do the most disrespectful thing in the game. Shooting tank barrels. Shame on you all. Well, surely you can make up your own rules as much as you want. Don't shoot the barrel. Don't outnumber the target. Don't finish a tank that's repairing. Don't tail the enemy in air battles. Whatever you like. It's your choice and your right to live by your own code. But in War Thunder, we simulate a battle as fierce and realistic as it can be. And in real battle, there's only one respect that really matters. The one you get for getting the job done and staying alive to secure the victory for your team. And the last message for today was written by some random fury. Does it seeking missile lose its seeking capability if the target turns its engine off? In theory, yes. In reality, you need to wait until the turbine cools down after you've stopped the engine fuel supply. Then, Somehow, start it again mid-air, and all this should ideally happen before your aircraft sticks its nose into the ground. That's it for today. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment. So, come on people, man up, subscribe to the channel, because I want you to. And press that bell button. Now, you gotta leave a like. And tell us what you think in the comments below. See you in a week.